Would you just join me on this uh, Sunday before I get started into the message? I want us to pray. We just finished our morning service and the presence of God as we prayed this morning was so overwhelming. And I pray that the same presence, the same Holy Spirit that fell in this room but a few moments ago would fall, would be poured out on us as we just seek Him, desire Him with our whole hearts. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of serving you. I thank you for what you did in this room this morning. I thank you for the atmosphere of your presence that was so real, so raw, so authentic. I thank you for how you touched people's lives in this room this morning. I thank you for hearing the story of your precious people. Lord, the story that you're writing in their lives, that they're awakening to. Lord, I thank you for what you showed me as we were praying, and I pray for that same, for that same thing Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, as I just begin, Father, more importantly than the message or the conversation we have, Lord, prayer is what opens the door. You said whatever we ask for in your name, if we pray according to your will, it shall be done. I pray for your will be done this morning. I pray that you touch your precious people. As you touch those that filled this room this morning, I pray that you will touch those that are watching this morning here online. And I ask that you begin to move, Lord, on their behalf. I ask you to open their eyes to see things they've not seen before in your word. I ask you to open our ears to hear what your Holy Spirit is saying to us. Lord, I ask, according to 1 John 2, that that anointing that is within us, that anointing, that teacher, will teach us everything we need to know. Lord, my understanding is limited. Lord, what they hear from me is limited because I'm so human. Lord, you are Holy Spirit, the great teacher of the church. And no one can teach God's word like you. So I welcome you, Holy Spirit, as the great teacher, the anointing inside of us to teach us, to reveal God's word to us. And though we may read in a verse or two, I ask that those verses become rhema. Lord, they come alive inside of us. Lord, that we see the truth and that that truth, in the knowledge of that truth, we will be set free. Lord, this morning, as we were praying, Lord, you showed me a picture in my spirit and I saw two pupils and I saw an oil covering the pupil. Lord, I saw oil being poured out on the eyes. I ask, Lord, that same oil, that same anointing wash over our eyesight, wash over our vision. Lord, let us begin to see things we've never seen. Lord, let us let our eyes be awakened to see, not only to be able to read between the lines, but to see between the lines. Lord, I ask you by your grace and by your mercy. Lord, I, Lord, I 
desire for your goodness to be manifest in everything that I share. I ask that your grace, your grace be manifest in everything that I share. Your mercy will be manifested in the things, in the word that I share. Lord, have your way and touch your precious people in these next few moments. Thank you for this privilege. Thank you for this privilege. I do not take it lightly. I do not take it lightly, Lord. I do not take it lightly. Now have your way. Have your way and be glorified in everything that is said and done. And Holy Spirit, would you just nudge me when it's time to end? Not a second too soon, not a second too late. I honor you in every way. And I honor your people, Lord. I honor your people. In Jesus' name, amen. We just concluded. I don't even know how to describe it to you. What God does in moments like this morning, and he's been doing it now for four weeks. The day that we walked into this temporary facility that first Sunday, things changed by force. He forced them. And it has literally changed the way I approach ministry or conversation. We've been in a series for a few weeks now. This is part three in it where I've just been talking about rethinking judgment. What I'm loving in this series, this teaching, is this conversation that is now taking place among God's people here. And in the way that it's shared, I will share from what the Lord has been speaking or dealing with me, but then I invite them into the conversation. And we literally just begin to talk and share and people give different perspectives. But it's, 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 it's like line upon line, precept upon precept. It, is, it reminds me of, of how Aaron's, th there was a compounding of the anointing on Aaron. Or in Psalms where that oil, that anointing would flow down from his head, beard down, and then it would literally like puddle at the feet. And that's what I gain. I feel like every time somebody, somebody shares a little bit of their story and what we're talking about, there's another layer of anointing. And there's ministry that's going on through people's stories. And even in the ones that are sharing that portion of revelation or insight, it is just done so well in, because the Holy Spirit leads it all. So a quick update. Um, we have been in talks and waiting for the final consent for our to sign a lease for a new facility um, just a small space but a beautiful space that literally is ready for us to move into but i'm going to take everything that we experience here now over the last several weeks and we are going to simply move the atmosphere even though we'll be a new location new furniture, new setup, but it's going to, it's going to be literally the same format because it is life giving to me after 38 years of, you know, being a preacher and a pastor and being a talking head. It is, I don't know, something has just really changed in me that I, I'm engaging in people's story because people's stories, their stories matter. And so I, I hope to be able to update you this week. And, and as soon as that lease is signed i will i will i will do a live i'll do a facebook live and just show you what we're walking into and what we're going to be a part of in our new season the last three weeks i've been talking about and sharing rethinking judgment 
And, and I, 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 there's a part of me that I, I wish I could invite you into the live feed or the, you know, that we were, that we would be live, but, um, I don't know right now I, I feel so focused or so I just want to I'm focused on the people that are here and then it gives me the opportunity afterwards to minister to you but I wish you could hear and sense the flow of what happens when we meet and just the the worship and the even though we don't have musicians or instruments the the worship is actually our prayer and when just praying together and inviting the Holy Spirit to come and be a part of everything that we do, especially as we pray together. It begins there. And then it's just this beautiful atmosphere that goes from prayer into a conversation around God's Word. So the last three weeks, I've been just sharing about rethinking judgment. And I don't want to, you know, I don't know, maybe the time will come when I'll be more in-depth and preach more and or whatever, teach and just share with you online but I'm just going to do my best right now just to flow with my heart and just to to say hey it's I'll give you this and you know that's it for now but and that that I'll trust the Holy Spirit that it will minister to you above everything else because you know the Holy Spirit can take two or three words and minister than to take an hour of just babble and random or rambling and do nothing with it so I want every word to be marked with his grace, his oil. And as I was praying this morning with our with the people, I literally did. I literally saw two pupils and I saw oil coming, just descending on the on the pupil. And so we prayed that before we got into the word because I wanted and asked God that they would see different. So when I started this series on rethinking judgment, we looked at the original sin of where judgment began. How did it start? And in Genesis 3, there is there's so much there that has so awakened me over the years, but in particular over the last several years, because I think for most of us, you know, as the older you get and the more mature you get in the faith, you can look back on things and go, wow, I, I believe things back when I was, you know, a younger um maybe not as as mature of a believer that I believe things and and heard things that I believed were true but until I got older and studied it for myself or the Lord revealed something different to me you know we believe one thing and and so so over this last two weeks in particular I've just been talking about rethinking judgment and and actually where did judgment begin how did it start what was the where was the original judgment and remembering over the last few weeks, for those of you that were, you know with with us are able to or not to see it, is that what is judgment? Judgment is the assumption of motive. Judgment is when you begin to assume you know somebody's heart. And so, when when we judge people, we're assuming we know their motive or we know their heart or we know their intentions and so we started in this series i started talking about how we judge others and last week in particular i focused on the four things the four reasons we judge people and insecurity is one reason Pride is another reason, fear is another reason, and envy is the final. So a lot of times we judge people because we have these reasons in our life. We're insecure, we're arrogant, or we're prideful, we're fearful, and we're envious. So we started to sort of unpack or... So where did judgment begin? How did it start? And so I'm approaching this subject matter in three different topics. Judging others, judging ourselves, and judging God. Those are the three main focuses. And they could be in four teachings or six teachings. I don't care. But the main thing is the revelation that comes to as to why we judge. Why do we judge people and why do we judge ourselves? And, and again, may I just say to you, self-judgment 
is very harmful to any of us. So where did it begin? Where did it start? How did it, how did this whole idea of judgment end? Because in the way that you view judgment, it actually determines on how you live your life of faith. So why do we judge others? Why do we judge ourselves, which is as harmful as judging others? And again, self-judgment is a dream killer. So let me say that to you again. Self-judgment is a dream killer. So judgment, and I hope that maybe just in me just talking, sharing, you'll hear my passion in it because it is, it is so alive in me. And I'm as guilty as anybody of judging people. I'm guilty of judging myself. I look back at the harm that I've done to my own life because of self-judgment. By whose standard? And why would I assume that I know the motives of others? How dare we elevate ourselves to a godlike status and say that we can judge other people's motives? Or we can judge others and think we know the intentions. So, in this particular setting, if you've never reread or read or reread and reread and reread Genesis chapter 3, I hope you do. Because that's where it all begins. That's where the original sin of judgment began. And in the way that Adam and Eve saw themselves for the first time, they saw themselves naked. They were ashamed. They were afraid, so they hid. They judged themselves. It was God who came back to them and said, Who said you're naked? Their entire perspective of God and themselves changed in that moment. But it was what God did after that moment that was so pivotal to us understanding of who He is. And so this morning, just the next few minutes, I want to talk to you not about judging yourself, which I still haven't really touched on. I may do that next week and literally show you just Jesus' journey through the Garden of Gethsemane. So we talked a lot the last two weeks on judging others. But now I want to ask you the most important question because the most important judgment any of us will ever make is actually about the intentions of God and how you and I judge God. I want to tell you, this has revolutionized my life over the past several years. Because when, when we judge God's intentions, we're actually judging His nature and the purposes of His heart. You see, this judgment will actually, in and of itself, will shape the rest of our walk of faith. In other words, how you see God will be how you relate to Him. Because if we judge God to be angry and vengeful, then we will feel, we will never feel safe in His presence. We will never feel that we can run into His presence. We, we actually will, will, we will run from spiritual intimacy. The reason we don't have a lot of spiritual intimacy with Him is because we're actually afraid of Him. So we hid. The three responses to sin in Genesis 3, first was shame. Second was fear, we hid ourselves. Third was blame. It was the woman you sent me. It was the serpent, it wasn't me. So the response to sin will always be shame, fear, blame. So, so when, when, when that exposure took place and they had partaken, Adam and Eve partook of the tree they had partaken of the tree, the fruit of the tree, from the, of literally the knowledge of good and evil. 
when they had partaken of that fruit that God literally had forbid them to touch, they could eat of any garden, any tree in the garden, just do not touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because in the day that you partake of it, which is what Lucifer said to them, God knows that in the day that you eat of it, you'll be just like him, you'll be wise just like God, you will know good from evil. And so they partook. And when they partook of the knowledge of good and evil, now they were elevated to a godlike status because now they knew they had the knowledge of good and evil. And the first manifestation of that failure or that fall or that sin was self-judgment. Think about it. We hid. We were naked. It was God who came and said, who told you you were naked? And what has nakedness, when has nakedness ever impacted anything about you? When have you even been aware of your nakedness? Why would nakedness now be an issue? It wasn't an issue before, but now it's an issue. Oh, and you hid because you were afraid. So your entire concept and perspective of me changed. Now you're afraid of me, so you had to hide from me. And now what we do with the rest of that will determine how we see God. And so if we, if we judge him to be angry, that's we're going to run from spiritual intimacy. If we judge him to be vengeful, we're never going to approach him because he's angry and he's simply going to punish me. So we've got this punitive God. If, but yet, if we judge him to be merciful, if we judge him to be gracious, then we can discover the most incredible, the most tangible connection with the Lord. And now we can actually begin to walk closely with him each and every day because our mind has changed. We've renewed our mind with the truth. Because there is nothing more important than your understanding and our understanding of God. This is where it all begins. So in Hebrews chapter 11, this is where this theme comes from. Because Sarah judged God to be faithful. And it says in Hebrews 11 verses 11 and 12, By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because, this is so good, because she judged him faithful who promised. So profound. Verse 12, therefore, from one man and him being as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sands which is by the seashore. So when Sarah judged God, she judged him to be faithful. And based on that judgment that he is faithful who had promised, he who promised is faithful. He is faithful, and because he's faithful, his promise that I would conceive in my old age shall come to pass. And so, so, so Sarah judged God, him, so she judged him as faithful. My question to you is, how have you lived your life in your judgment of God? How do you see him? Because how you see him will determine how you're going to live your life out. Because if you judge him to be angry, then you won't approach him. If you judge him to be gracious, you'll have no problem approaching him. So Sarah judged him faithful, and because she did that, she received blessings that literally radically transformed her life, transformed her future, and literally were, it was the beginning of the human race, simply because she judged him to be faithful. She judged him to be faithful to his promises. He gave Adam, uh, he gave uh, Abraham and Sarah a promise. And because Sarah judged him to be faithful to the promises, those promises came to pass. So if we, if we judge him faithful, then our measure expands from, from something being contained to being uncontainable. 
we go from we go from small to big and so the process of renewing our minds are gonna they're gonna involve two things two things two distinct strengths this is where I pray God will literally cause the oil to come over your eyes as you read his word so two distinct strengths right moving from moving away from the old ways or the old things and moving towards the new so here's how I I'm, I'm gonna I'm going to I'm going to move away from rejection and I'm going to move into acceptance because here's the deal if we struggle to trust God it is likely that our image of him is wrong so I want to move away from the old and I want to move into the new I want to reject something that I may have believed because I never studied it, somebody preached it, somebody said it, but I never took the time to actually ask God to show me, reveal to me who he is. So I'm, one is rejection, I'm going to reject things that I've heard that have been presented to me uh, because of whether immaturity, ignorance, or whatever, that again, we, we own, our, our understanding is very limited very limited we can sit and listen to preacher after preacher after preacher after preacher leader after leader great teachers great men and women of faith and of god and are anointed but yet we have a teacher within first john 2 says and that teacher is the anointing and that anointing will teach us and again i know even in sharing with you my understanding is very limited so that's why i'm asking you to ask the holy spirit to teach you to open your eyes to where you are today in your faith and how you walk with God today. Because how you walked with Him 10 years ago will not, it may not carry you to where you need to go. The faith that I received when I was saved has only increased because that, that faith was there to save me. It was a saving faith, but now I need a faith that I can walk in, a maturing faith, a growing faith, a, a strengthening faith. And so that's what's happened to me. So again, if we struggle to trust God, it's likely because our image of him is wrong and it needs to be addressed. So if, if, if we see him as he is, then trust is as easy as breathing. The reason we don't trust him is because we actually struggle in our perspective. We've judged him to be angry. We've judged him to be vengeful. We've judged him to be uh, a God who, 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 only, um, who will reject us if we don't follow through on everything. So again, people can only teach us what they know and can only allow the Holy Spirit within the boundaries of their own understanding. Paul said we all prophesy in part. So no one has the whole measure but the Spirit of God. So Sarah's life, I think, serves us as a wonderful example of what happens when we judge God as faithful. Her heart and her mind were aligned with the truth. And because her heart and her mind was aligned with the truth, her body was miraculous, miraculously strengthened so that she could conceive and carry a child despite her old age. Come back. Her heart and her mind was aligned with this truth, with the truth. And because her heart and her mind were aligned with truth, her body now was miraculously strengthened so that she could conceive because she judged him faithful who promised and so her whole life was changed her future reshaped her dreams brought to life because she judged god correctly and so this is then the reward awaiting us he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him and so there was a prize that she was to that was to be grasped there was a prize there was a reward that she was to hold and it's up to you and i individually to grab a hold and to grasp that prize so
what what is your perspective of him how do you see him one of the young ladies in the service this morning was just her just so new to her faith walk she was talking to of us in the room and she said you know i've i've always had this these two opinions of god that there was an old testament god who was you know old testament and angry and commandments and laws and then there's a new testament god jesus and you know that he made everything okay but her mindset until a couple of weeks ago that was rocked by what we shared and that came out of genesis 3 she said i've never seen i've never seen this perspective of god being so gracious in the old covenant and again she's young in her faith but in the way that she's grown up as a Christian, because she's been a Christian for a long time, but what she had heard was, again, the Old Testament, God was angry. The Old Testament, God would take people out and kill them. But she never had the perspective that it actually the Old Testament, God was the same gracious God in the, in the New Covenant. And so the reason I say all that is because Many of us believers, including myself, have been presented with untruths about God that have actually led us into false judgments, not of people, but we've actually, we've actually fallen into or led into false judgments about Him, which in turn have limited our spiritual intimacy and our ability to receive from Him. This is how important this is. So I'm not going to dwell on it. So, because until we see the Lord's nature clearly, we will instinctively keep Him at a distance. Again, I'm ashamed. I've sinned. I hid. Because it's one thing to claim that you trust God. I challenge the people this morning. said, how many of you trust God? And we all said, yes, of course we trust God. But then my second question was, how many of you truly trust? do so i mean it's easy to say you're trust you trust him when everything's going well but my question would be when all hell is breaking loose or in you and around you do you still trust him can you still say it as easily as effortlessly as when everything is going well because really that's when the real trust takes place and so in that moment how you see him how you perceive him will determine whether you run to him in spiritual intimacy or you run from him because you see him as an angry, ticked off, grumpy old man. So I firmly believe this. I firmly believe that every believer who sees God as the author of their suffering cannot truly draw close to him. I'll say that again. As long as you see him as the author of your suffering, you will have a hard time pursuing spiritual intimacy with God. And so to, to have an accurate image of God at the forefront of our minds, I always want to focus on Jesus because he was the manifestation of the Godhead. And so in John chapter 14, and we're going to just do this real quickly. In John chapter 14, verses 8 through 10, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. And Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still do not know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So powerful. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does this work through me. Profound. Profound. So my question then would be, who was it that had compassion on the sick? Talking to that young lady whose faith is growing and exploding. 
Who was it that had compassion on the sick? Was it Jesus? Or was it actually the Father in him? So it was actually the Father who had compassion on the sick. It was the Father who, had, who was healing them of their diseases. Okay, well then it was the Father who called Zacchaeus from the tree and extended a hand of friendship. It was through Jesus, but it was the Father in Jesus. It was the Father who taught grace and forgiveness and mercy. It was the Father who fed the hungry, who cared about those who were in captivity. It was the Father seeking them to set them free. It was the Father who looked after the disciples, who loved on them as friends, as brothers, as sisters. It was all manifested through Jesus, but it was the Father at work. Again, uh, she judged him to be faithful who promised. How you perceive the Father, how you perceive God will determine how you live your life out every single day. You see, if you perceive Him to be gracious, trusting Him will be like breathing. Walking daily with Him will be effortless. Yes, you will have the moments where you fall and you get on your knee and you get back up. But you see, again, it's... It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are, they're one. They are one. They were one then. They are one today. In Jesus, again, we see the important nature of God. And yet on the flip side is also true. Because if you can't see Jesus in it, then you know what? It's not the nature of God. If Jesus is not in it, you cannot say, this is God. Because if Jesus is not in it, it is not God's nature. But if Jesus is in it, that is God's nature. So I, it's just very simple to me in the fact that, again, let me ask a question. Did Jesus ever make somebody sick instead of healing them? The answer is no. Did he ever tell a person that in their case, he refused to heal them because their affliction was sent by God as either it was, it was, it was, it was there to, it was sent to, dis, like I said, to teach them something. The answer is no. Did he ever curse another human being, even when he was being tortured and, and mocked by his own creation? The answer is no. Did he ever feed someone who refused? Did he ever feed some, but then refuse to feed others? The answer is no. So God is a healer. Let me bring the proper perspective of who God is to you. God is a healer. God is a deliverer. God is a protector. God is a provider. And anyone that tells you otherwise is actually undermining your faith even even if though they mean well, the, the point is you you do you don't put up with it. Do not put up with it. Stick with Jesus, not religion. So the day that I accepted that God is good and God is good all the time. God does not have a bad day, there's not a bad moment. The day that I accept, accepted that God is good all the time was the day that I actually learned to adore him because he would never do me harm and he will always seek what is best for my life and so how you perceive him how you see him will determine how you walk out the rest of your life you see, James 1, 16 and 17 says, don't be deceived. My dear brothers and sisters, he says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. So let me go back to Hebrews 11 for you. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who promised. So my question to you is, how, how are you judging him right now in your life? 
You see, <laughs> how you see him will determine whether you're going to trust him, whether you're going to run to him in spiritual intimacy or from him. And so let me, let me, yeah, I'm going to just really just lock in on this and I'm, I won't be able to give you all the verses, but, but, but let me just come back to where it all started. And, and I, I can't for the sake of time and also just so that I'm not always, or not, I'm not always, but just go and research it and study it yourselves. Study Genesis chapter 3. Because everything about judgment, the original sin of judgment began there. That's where it started. You see, the first rule of pride is to always see ourselves as right and to judge everyone else, and to judge everyone using us as the standard. Let me say that to you again. The first rule of pride is that to see to see ourselves as right and to judge everyone using us as the standard. So if you agree with me, you're right. If you disagree with me, you're wrong. All right, so where did this whole judgment thing begin? All right, so then this leads me then to the importance of why, what is judgment? Judgment is assuming the motive of others. You see, Judging motives is this, because I'm right, and because I'm always right, I not only know that you're wrong, I also know the sinful, malicious, vin vindictive, uh, vengeful, hateful motives behind you disagreeing with me. You see, when you disagree with me, now I don't just, it's not just in a disagreement, it's now I see you different. I see you malicious. I see you vengeful. I see your bad motives. You see, judgment is assuming you know someone's motives and you don't. So when Jesus said, judge not, there's a reason for that. All right, so let's go back real quickly, real quickly, and I mean it. Because as soon as we judge others, it sets the stage for conflict. And God will not be honored until we actually repent of our pride and repent of our arrogance. And so here's Adam and Eve, and they live in this perfect environment. They live in this perfect communion with God. But there's always a choice to be made, right? Because God created us to be free will beings. Because free will is the fundamental to who you are or who we are, and perhaps the highest honor that we have. And so Adam and Eve chose, the, 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 the Adam, Adam and Eve's choice revolved around whether or not to eat from the tree, the tree, this is important, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They understood that eating the fruit of that tree would change them. They believed that they would be like God, which is what the serpent said. And so, now they are now they would know they would know because they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil now they're going to know the, the they're going to know the nature of good and the nature of evil and god actually said now because of they they partook of this tree and this fruit they are, they become like us knowing good from evil and so we remember what took place right and so for the first time, because now they partook of that, they partook of that fruit, they had now departed, there, there was a departure from innocence when they ate that fruit. And for many years in my personal Christian faith, my understanding was that God was angry with them for breaking the rules. Ooh. And God was angry with me for breaking the rules. And he had harshly cursed them and had kicked them out of, out of Eden for their rebellion. However, if you will read the story, and if you will read the account from the perspective of who God is and how you judge him, it will determine how you see that account. 
And so, for the first time, they knew and embraced shame. Covering their nakedness, hiding from God. In other words, they gained another perspective of themselves. Excuse me, that was, I literally just burped. <laughs> ah. Power bars. And so the first thing they did, the first thing they did was they judged themselves. And the first thing they did with that knowledge of good and evil was they judged them, they literally was to judge themselves evil. Listen to that. This is why self judgment is a dream killer. Because before we judge others, we judge ourselves and they judge themselves as evil. So they hid, they were ashamed and the shame they knew stemmed from the deceptive knowledge, which is what causes people to measure themselves against the standard they cannot keep. And so <laughs> the knowledge of good and evil can there be, therefore can be summed up in one word, judgment. They made judgments. They made themselves judges first of themselves, of their own worthiness, but yet it's only God who can judge our worthiness because it is only God who knows our motives. So let me take you back to where this whole series is built on and then I'm wrapping it up here. So the whole series is built on rethinking judgment is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. And it's when Paul says, I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. He says, indeed, I don't even judge myself. There is liberty right there. And we'll touch on that hopefully next week. He says, my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motive of the heart. It is the Lord who will expose the motive of the heart. Only the Lord can expose the motive of the heart. So he says, Paul says, look, I care very little that you judge me and I feel the same way. And I care very little about, you know, how, how, how the human, how the, how, how court, how, how human beings will see me or how any human court sees me because he says, I don't even judge myself. So if I don't judge myself, do you think I actually care about people judging me? Nope, I don't because I don't even judge myself. You know why? Because the Lord is my judge and you people may judge my outward appearances or behaviors, but you see. The Lord exposes the motives of the heart because no one knows the intents or the motives of the heart, but Jesus. So again, how do you see that story? Because we can't even accurately measure our motives. <laughs> we can't even accurately measure the motives of our own heart, let alone anybody else's. But how good, huh? How good are we at exposing or, or measuring or, or just, you know, like we can read somebody else's motives and assume their motives and we can't even assume ours. We don't even know what our heart is like. So it is the Lord who judges us. Why? Because only the Lord knows the motives of the heart. That's why it's so important not to judge people until you hear, not even until hear their story, hear the pain they came out of. And so, As soon as we judge others, we've literally elevated ourselves to a godlike status because now we've done no, nothing. We've done the same thing as Adam and Eve. We've partaken of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And now we think we're like God. And so the instant result was that they were now swift to judge both themselves and God and embraced shame as a cloak. They embraced shame as their covering. 
And now this then sheds light to or on the curse and the banishment. And so my belief after years and years of studying and research is that what I thought for years was their banishment or their, their banishment was punitive, it wasn't. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a, it wasn't punishment. My belief is that the curse wasn't punishment because, and, and the truth is I have actually fully abandoned that thought because the belief that the curse was tailored punishment that then expressed the heart and the will of God is hard for me to grasp. Because instead of judging them or killing them, what God goes on to do is God goes and he slaughters an animal. And when they were covered with a cloak of shame, when God told them, get out of the garden, get out of Eden and get out now, we see it as punishment. God said, no, it's mercy. And so God says, get out, get out now. You've partaken of the fruit of the knowledge from the tree of good and evil. You now can make judgments on people, but you don't know their hearts. And you will assume you know their motives and you will assume you know their intents, but you're not us. You're not me. Out. Because only the Lord knows the motives. And we will judge and measure people in accordance to our failings, our righteousness. And yet Isaiah says our righteousness is as filthy rags before him as the best you can be, at the holiest you can be, it's still as dirty rags. So God said, out, out. Don't you step back into this Garden of Eden until. And God steps out and he takes an animal and he sacrifices the animal and blood is shed. And there is a, remember now, they're standing there and there is a cloak of shame over them. And God kills the animal, blood is shed, there is a cleansing for their sin, and God takes the skin of the animal. He rips off the cloak of shame and he places around them the cloak of grace. When he banished them from the garden, it wasn't punitive. It was mercy. You see, because if they would have remained in the garden, and if they would have remained in their shame, and in their fear, and in their blame, if they would have touched and partaken of the fruit of the tree of eternal life, they would have been literally as in frozen in time. They would have remembered their shame forever. They, will have, they would have remembered the torment forever. They would have remembered their failure forever. So when God said out, it wasn't punitive, it was mercy. And it wasn't just mercy for them, it was mercy for you and I. Because when God literally, when, when God had taken and, and taken an animal and literally sacrificed it and slaughtered it and blood was shed, it was all redemptive. It was the pre- plan of what Jesus would come and do for the world. What God did for Adam and Eve was but a remedy, a plan put in place for what would come when his son would die on a cross, <laughs> the lamb sacrificed for the sins of the world. So he had compassion on them, understanding that now they now knew that, that 
the, the shame and, and, and literally the, the, they had turned on themselves and, and they're judging themselves and, and God didn't come and point his finger. God didn't come and berate them. But mercifully, but mercifully dealt with their immediate problem. Hebrews 9.22 says, For there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. The slaughtering of an animal, for its skin was a symbol of Christ, who would be slain to cover our sin and the sin of the whole world. And so God didn't judge Adam and Eve. He clothed them. God didn't kick them out of Eden. No, it was a merciful act. Can you imagine if they would have lived forever in such a broken, twisted, unbearable punishment? And so God banished them from, per from perfection for our sake. Planning to bring us back when the time is right through Jesus. This is the God we see in Eden. We don't see a God who pointed his finger and berated them. We see a God who was gracious to them, choosing not to judge them but to protect them and to protect us from ourselves. And that's why he said, don't judge. That's why he says, don't assume the motives. Don't have an assumption of motives, not even your own. Because some of you have judged yourself way too severely. And God not only wants to deliver you from how you've judged others, but he wants to deliver you from how you've judged yourself. But it begins with how you judge him. Do you see him as gracious? Do you see him as loving? Do you see him as good all the time? Do you see him merciful? Because that's who he is. Religion will kick you out of the garden. Religion will banish you. God will never banish you or punish you. God will love you and consume you with his love. 1 John 4, verse 10 says, This is love. Not that we loved ourselves, but that God sent His Son as a propitiation for our sins. That, my friend, began in the garden when God looked at Adam and Eve and said, Out. Out. And slaughtered an animal and covered them the blood of that animal and the skin and said you will no longer walk with the cloak of shame but the cloak of my grace that is unmerited favor compassion Father I pray in Jesus name for every single person Lord who's watching listening I pray for that oil to cover their eyes and may they see you different than they've ever seen you before may their perception of you forever change may they see you as the rewarder of those who diligently seek him may they judge you 
as Sarah judged you. Faithful. Faithful. Who promised. Forgive us for our perceptions. Forgive us for our perspectives. Forgive us for ever judging you different than who you are. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your goodness. Bless your people with your presence. Bless your people with your peace. Bless your people with your provision. And bless them with your protection, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for just taking the time to listen. And I pray that the Lord will change your life so that you never judge yourself, you never judge others, because the way you judge him will determine how you live your life. May trusting him become as effortless as breathing from this day forward. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for just being such a blessing to us. Everything you give is going towards our place of meeting. And I thank you. I thank you for that. I thank you for that. Allowing us to do what God has called me to do. To bring a band of broken people together. To hear their story. And to see them heal. You're a big part of that. And I'm grateful, very grateful for it. God bless you. Hopefully, you'll see me somewhere in the middle of the week with an announcement. And hopefully, I can walk you through our small but new place that will be called home to us. Love you guys. Have a great Sunday.